good afternoon excellencies president mr hamz rahman of the indo arab chamber of commerce ambassador anil trigunai ji the board member of both indo arab chamber of commerce and industry and mi i c and a chamber sumit sharma my colleague committee member viewers ladies and gentlemen it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all at this very useful webinar title doing business with libya under the umbrella of the indo arab chamber of commerce and industry jointly with our partner the millennial india international chamber of commerce industry and agriculture who are our partner today i'm further pleased to inform you that today we have uh, more than 486 registration that shows how important to this topic is from the business point of view most of the participants are new to this forum so for them let me share with them about our chamber its activities in brief our chamber has been established in the year 19 1980 rendering services to the business community of both india and the arab world we are committed to provide services to the business communities to promote bilateral trade economic commerce and friendly relations between india and the arab world we have about 5800 odd members all over india in all categories we have entered into many agreement with various overseas chambers of commerce both in the arab world and gcc country as well i am myself being one of the founder director of the chamber and currently the executive director of the chamber associated with the chamber since 1983 <clears throat> traveled extensively to almost all the arab countries now some information about the world arab world is arab world is located in africa and asia the arab world comprises of 23 countries by adding south sudan today the arab world is part of india's extended neighborhood the total gdp of the arab world is 2815 trillion dollar the total population of entire arab world is more than 427 million and uh, the most populous country is egypt with 1 billion population and smallest is comoros with about 795000 people area wise algeria is the biggest country in miles and bahrain is the smallest uh, in square miles region wise arab countries have been india's largest trading partner with about us dollar 162 billion so the bilateral trade have already crossed and it covers a variety of goods and services from oil to infrastructure and telecommunication to consumer goods it is also home for more than 7 million indians and caters to 60% of our crude oil import country wise today uae has been india's largest trading partner and india's exports grew at a modest rate of 5.49% to touch 41.55 billion dollar so these were some synopsis about the arab world now about today's speaker mr anil trigunai ji ifs retired our ambassador for libya jordan and malta welcome you sir Thank he you. has has been a member of indian foreign service has served in the indian mission in the following country ivory coast bangladesh usa mongolia russia sweden nigeria libya malta and jordan It's nearly about 10 countries he was also joint secretary for the gulf and hajj division he has lot many credential to his profile he is on the board of brics chamber asia africa chamber He is also the president of MIICIA Chamber, who is a partner today with us. He is also acted as peace ambassador with the Interfaith Dialogue, Peace and Harmony at Kazakhstan. He is a multilingualist, knows Russian, French, Spanish, besides other local languages. During his regime as ambassador to Libya, the chamber was successful in hosting a 32-member delegation from Libya. and we have signed an mou with the libyan then libyan chambers of commerce so it is indeed an honor and privilege to invite ambassador anil trigunai ji so welcome you here and uh, the floor is all yours over to you sir thank, thank you. you madam namaste and very warm welcome to all my friends who have joined us this afternoon it was indeed a great pleasure and a bit of a surprise for me 
when you told me that for today we have more than 486 uh, registered, registered participants. Uh, that's really a great thing. And I, in fact, I had shared this information on our, uh, on my social media, uh, this thing, and a lot of my friends told me, can we join? And hopefully they are there. Several of them have been uh, part of this journey through Libya and uh, the difficult times. Uh, so my the compliments to you personally, madam. Uh, we have worked earlier when I was in service, and uh, this is in the second avatar that we are working together. Uh, my compliments also and congratulations to the chairman and the board of uh, IA, IA Indo Arab Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I'm sure that the Misia Chamber will also find uh, more opportunities to work together with you. Uh, when you asked me to talk about Libya, Libya is, I mean, you know that uh, for us diplomats, whenever we are posted in a country, a part of us is left behind. And so for me personally, um, Libya holds a very special place. So I intend to talk about today uh, in three or four, uh, basically, formats. And one is that I'll talk to you about the current situation in Libya, what exactly happening. We are hearing a lot about it, and it has been ongoing for the last decade or so. Then I will talk about my time when I was in uh, Libya. And then I will uh, talk about the current business climate in Libya and the opportunities. And then lastly, some of the questions that have been received, uh, those uh, I'll try to attempt answering those. Well, as you know that Libya, frankly, uh, was in, until 2010, comparatively peaceful country. Of course, uh, Gaddafi, Gaddafi's period of 42 years, large part of it was marked by problems, uh, by lack of freedom, by torture, by killings. And he had antagonized himself a great deal, both with the world community leaders and the uh, people on the ground. There was, you could not talk anything against the government. There were really no freedom at all. Uh, at that time during his period, if you fell in line with his green book, with his thoughts, thought processes, or with his system, you could enjoy the benefits because he tried to propagate a socialist kind of a, a society, he looked after people. For example, the healthcare was free, education was free in the country, people, uh, unemployment allowance and insurance, despite the sanctions that Libya had been under for many, many decades. But so that apart, but at the same time, the people need a little more. And I think uh, for them in 2010, uh, the one of the hawkers in Tunisia burnt himself. And that led to the so-called Arab Spring. And with him, we saw first time, and, and I want to just tell you that uh, Libya's problems are actually attributable not only to the Libyans, but it is to the regional countries in the Gulf and the countries in the West. So they are the, really, the, the, in my view, the real culprit of today's or past 10 years uh, problems are the external powers in the country. And it is continuing today also. So when uh, Tunisia, in fact, the French who had the sway there, they thought it was a law and order situation. And they offered to send uh, their gendarmes. But by the time it was too late, they realized that President Ben Ali had to run away. And thereafter, the revolution quickly moved to Egypt. And Egypt also, uh, they could not do much, and Mubarak had to leave in a short time. Then the next person who always stood up to the West throughout his career, essentially, he did not trust them, and he was trying to be king of kings or whatever. So he had antagonized all the Gulf monarchs, and he had also antagonized all the Western powers. So all of them thought that this was the appropriate time. And obviously, the ordinary Libyans were unhappy with the way things were. They wanted a little more freedom and initiative to do on their own. And they were seeing what was happening elsewhere. And uh, Libya is a very rich country. But for a rich country like that, I tell you a small incident that when uh, Sheikh Zayed of UAE visited uh, uh, Libya, uh, Tripoli, in uh, uh, 1973, he asked Gaddafi that I wish Dubai could be like Tripoli. And if you have been to uh, 
Triple E, you know what has happened to, uh, to Dubai, where it has reached, what has happened to Abu Dhabi in the desert. But uh, Triple E, despite being on the Mediterranean with the 2,000 kilometer coastline, beautiful country, their infrastructure, nothing was done much, which an oil rich country. It is the fifth uh, largest in the world and also one of the, um, uh, in Africa, it is the biggest producer of oil. And man, not many people know that uh, the, uh, it is also one of the richest in shale deposits. So that is the next phase if they were able to uh, uh, keep this country together. So the, the, the problem, what happened, revolution succeeded, the Dafi was killed in October of that year. But at the same time, the, in 2011, and that's when the, all these countries, once the Dafi went there, the Americans, the NATO, nobody had any plan of what to do after this. There were no institutions, modern institutions. So they could not create any institutions. But the most unfortunate part of this whole process is that just a few years ago, Gaddafi had begun to be a little bit westernized because it, he had started economic reforms. 2010 economic reforms were the most far reaching because his son, who had studied in London School of Economics, Saif al Islam, wanted to introduce the reforms. And they, were, they had become very close to the French, the Italian, the British, and the Americans had begun to like them as well. So it was at that time that Gaddafi did not think that his newfound Western friends uh, will ditch him. And this is precisely what they did. Anyway, that is the longest story, but everybody thought that now the things are okay. So this is immediately uh, in the uh, aftermath of Gaddafi that I, uh, death of Gaddafi that I was posted there. It took me a little while longer because uh, they were not clearing our uh, visas uh, and our ag uh, agrima. Uh, so it took me a little longer. So I reached there after uh, Gaddafi's, uh, Gaddafi was killed and the country was in a total mess. Total mess because everybody who had arms kept to themselves. The militia groups, there are thousands of militia groups, and they are as powerful as uh, small armies. They were well-trained, and they fought with one another for, for resources, for influence. It was kind of a mohalla gundabaz, gundabaz. And they were all being supported uh, by the Western countries and by the regional countries. Now, over time, what happened is General Haftar, whom we hear a lot now, he came in 2014 and he wanted to be appointed. And earlier he used to be a general of um, Gaddafi and was fighting for him in Chad. And after that, he fell out with favor from Gaddafi and he went to the US and was apparently having close ties with the CIA, as people say. He was brought back along with several other prominent leaders who became leaders. They had lost touch uh, with the country. But General Haftar uh, wanted to become the army chief. Somehow he could not become. And therefore, he was very unhappy and he went to the uh, eastern part of Libya, Benghazi, and started his own uh, rise to power. Uh, today, he has this Libyan National Army and he is basically controlling the eastern part of Libya. On the other end, the western part, after the elections that were held there, which were the most successful elections, and I had reported to Delhi that I have not seen these kind of elections being held in a, in a, in a recent democracy or even the big democracies. Most successful elections that were held there was in 2012, in which a government was elected, but the Western countries who were supporting it were not helpful at all, and they did not think how things are. Their only objective was somehow to keep the Muslim Brotherhood out. And in the process, everything became uh, problematic and nobody wanted to give up the power and they had a power vacuum and the militia groups became far more stronger. There were no plan to disarm them. There were no plan to integrate them. There were no economic plan. It's a rich country, they got some money and they started uh, you know, so putting the country above. But very recently, let me come down. So this thing, this situation has continued. One year ago, General Leftar wanted to take over Tripoli by force. So he came there and he started uh, attacking them, but somehow with the, uh, because there is a, uh, generally the UN recognized government of Fayez Saraj, which is in the uh, western part of Libya and Tripoli, uh, is there and the, the Misrata militias and everybody else was supporting them. And the, they are also, let me uh, tell you that uh, this part, eastern uh, Libya is supported by Egypt, by supported by UAE, supported by the French, on the other hand, now Turkey is the latest entrant and Turkey has been supporting uh, the government in Tripoli and they somehow uh, expelled uh, General Haftar's forces very recently. 
But in the process, the situation has really gone from bad to worse uh, on every day. In the meantime, the Western countries decided that we must have some kind of an approach. And so in January, there was a meeting in Berlin at the initiative of, uh, General, uh, of uh, German Chancellor. And all the countries and everybody came there and they agreed to bring about some kind of peace and ceasefire. Uh, anyway, now Turkey, with the Turkey's introduction in the, uh, in the army uh, and leading their east, Western uh, Libya uh, has caused more complications. Turkey has always been, you remember that these are all used to be part of Ottoman Empire at one time. So Turkey has close relations, economic relations, economic ties, and has its own uh, objectives in the Mediterranean. So uh, Turkey is a powerful country, it is a NATO country. So you can see in Libya, you are seeing the NATO countries fighting one against the other. They are on the one side or the other side. So this is why now they are trying to work out some kind of a thing. Situation continues to be very bad. Life uh, on the uh, grassroots level is really very, very difficult. Uh, there is no security whatsoever at the moment. You cannot predict what will happen tomorrow. But today, at least they are divided into two uh, portions and the third one, of course, in the south. Everybody, as you mentioned earlier, the oil-rich countries, oil is something that has been of utmost importance uh, to the Western countries, especially, because Italy and France are the major importers of the, uh, the Libyan oil. So the situation today remains as difficult. And I came to the scene there in uh, 2012, when at that time, uh, when I arrived there in, in Delhi, we had no information because our embassy had moved to trade. Uh, India's virtually were being hated at the grassroots level for the simple reason that in keeping with our independent foreign policy, we had abstained on the UN resolution 1973 that allowed the um, uh, no-fly zone as well as bombing of Libya. So that is something, but it was played up by the Western media, by, the, uh, by those who were interested in, uh, because we, uh, India, Russia, and China uh, had opposed, uh, had abstained, did not oppose it. So therefore, in the, we were in the United Nations at that time. So people started feeling cheated by, from the Indians. They thought that they expected, the revolutionaries thought that India is with Gaddafi. And that was hardly the case because uh, we always used to tell Gaddafi that do please talk to your own people, have a dialogue with them, resolve the problem like that. But he had his own ways and I think his time had come and he had become slightly uh, insane in that last few uh, days of his life. So my first problem by essentially when, I, when you see an Indian and people start abusing you, that is not something that you would want. And uh, therefore, my first job was essentially to try to create an environment where Indians are really looked back with respect and with little affection. So I tried whatever it was, and fortunately, that all worked out. And it worked out, I was very lucky also, because the president of the country, first Yusuf Magarif, uh, was ambassador to Delhi at one time. And I had um, met him um, when I used to study in JNU and also in the, in the hotel almost every day we used to meet because our, my embassy residence was burgled totally and uh, destroyed. And then the next press, prime minister who became, was my class, my friend from JNU again. So that helped me a great deal from the political point of view. And locally also we tried to do Indian government was very keen and we were able to normalize the situation to that extent. But in the process, we were, it had a large number of projects. Many big Indian companies were working there. They had lost everything in the progress. Billions of dollars of losses were there. How to take it out, how to get their money back was the biggest, another problem. So I worked with the Turkish people because Turkey, Turkey had a little bit of a benefit there. And uh, I tried to talk to them and somehow we were able to get back. But one thing I told my people, I said, listen, we need to show on the ground even if there is total lawlessness, people are firing here and there, that we will complete these essential projects. And we did complete. Our Indians were the first ones to return. I got the ban lifted and our nurses came and they, they were paid at very high uh, rates because the government agreed. They respected the Indian labor and they respected the Indian uh, nurses and the doctors. And you will be surprised that the doctors refused to leave during the height of the revolution, Indian doctors, and they continued to work there throughout. So we had generated a very uh, goodwill and all Indians put together started working on it. And we finally, 
found that it was really something that was going on well for Indians. Unfortunately, the situation um, got much worse after that. In the process, I thought that we must get some business delegations. So we got the CII delegation. I even got 100 Indian companies to participate in the Tripoli International Fair during that period. And they all made very good business. They started looking at India in, in, in all the sectors, pharma sector, the healthcare sector, uh, in the oil and gas sector. We used to have oil blocks there, which are now uh, virtually in disuse. So we tried our best uh, in the situation, given situation at that time. And the things moved smoothly for India. And I'm very happy that at that time, uh, things are beginning to look good. And we were hoping about $2 billion worth of trade was there, which was very good from our, our perspective and our point. But what happens today, actually? Now, when we come today, we, I was just looking at the statistics, and I find that the Indian, um, the, uh, our export import total put together is somewhere around $136 million, which is really nothing uh, for a country where we used to have $2 billion, and we were hoping to even cross that uh, the following years. But then, uh, if you look at it from a businessman's point of view, a, the, wherever there is a risk, there is also a great opportunity. But as you are aware that because of the continuing problems and uh, some Indians being kidnapped and the situation happened that a war going on, conflict, the Indian government was once again forced to uh, issue um, you know, an order uh, not allowing the Indian nationals to travel to Libya. And for their own interest, obviously, because anybody who's kidnapped, that becomes a very major problem. Uh, and today, uh, as we know, that there is no real um, government in that sense that that can ensure the safety of the people. Even though we, we see it in Benghazi and all things are happening, Tripoli, if you go broadly, you will see it, it looks like a normal kind of a city. If you go to Misrata, that is far more uh, uh, stronger as far as the industrial base is concerned. So there is there, but then uh, very recently, in fact, is when the fight happened. So our uh, spokesman spoke about this. Uh, he said that the continuing conflict and instability in Libya is a matter of international concern. We support the efforts towards immediate cessation of all hostilities in Libya. We acknowledge the recent international efforts in this direction, including the Berlin International Conference and the Cairo Declaration of 6 June and hope that these initiatives will promote the peaceful resolution of the conflict through an intra-Libyan dialogue, taking into account the legitimate aspirations of the Libyan people while preserving Libya's sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity. These are extremely important pointers from our foreign policy point of view. We want a sovereign, united, and um, a country with complete territorial integrity. But today, as the things stand, let us be sure that Eastern part of Libya is under General Haftar and his, uh, uh, the, the Tobruk based government, and the Tripoli is actually under uh, the GNA and uh, uh, President or Prime Minister, if you call him, Fayez al Saraj, which is the United Nations. So, this is the situation. So, in a way, virtual, there is a virtual division in the country. And both have separate governments, there are two parliaments, there are two prime ministers there. You know, so that's a, that's a very big problem that anybody who wanting to do business must think about it. Indian government has not specifically taken side of any of the government there. We are waiting for a united government or some kind of a uh, situation uh, come to it and we maintain our embassy. It's still there, although there are only security people there live in uh, our embassy. Embassy moved to, to Tripoli. The amb Indian ambassador uh, in Tunis is actually the ambassador now looking after uh, Libya. So anything you need to do, you need to go uh, and talk to our ambassador uh, in, in Tunis and that, that they will be able to, they are still continuing to do something. Now, as I mentioned earlier that uh, health, education, IT, training, infrastructure, oil and gas, power, renewable energy, all these are very important sectors in the country. And we need to be able to provide that and the Indian companies have that possibility wherever. We have, we had built power plants there, we have done roads there, we have been involved in the telecom sector at one time. So India has a history of executing various big large scale projects. We have many construction uh, companies that were doing roads and bridges and uh, housing. 
uh, major power plants were there that have been there. Infrastructure, we have done quite a bit. And I want to tell you that even when we were there and that despite all the opposition, our companies were able to participate. And I remember I been meeting Dr. Ali Zidane, who was my friend and the prime minister. When I went to meet him, I said, listen, my companies can compete. Why are you giving to the Koreans or the, um, the, the Italians or anybody else this project? My company is a better place than that. He said, no, but the, none of the Western countries want you here. That's the problem. I said, allow them the free level playing field. And if they can't do after that, then it's okay, don't give it. And fortunately, Indian company, Akush Lloyd was there. We were able to get a very big project for $680 million at the time. That was the first real big green field project which the Indian companies do. Indian IT companies have been involved there. Companies like DSS and JMR Infotech were providing software assistance to the Libyan banks as well as technical support uh, to Central Bank of Libya. So there is, they know it, and the Central Bank governor is a good friend of mine, and he was always very, very helpful in helping the Indian companies. We also had proposed at one time that uh, if, the, if the Libyans were able to give us uh, sufficient quantities of gas, we'd be happy to set up a billion dollar UDA project there. So, but unfortunately that did not move uh, from there. So our investments are still held up there. Uh, the Indian companies have lost a great amount of money and, uh, but someday will come when they will be able to get it. We were ready to uh, set up a center of excellence in the IT sector in Libya and several trading institutes, including in the agricultural laboratory. And so we were in the SME sector, we were trying to work with them more closely. And that is what, uh, the Indians uh, are good at, and Indians can take chance, can also move forward. You, Alana, you mentioned, I mean, of course, they are supplying meat there, uh, have been supplying to, to Libya as well. Now, as you know, for the telemedicine and e-education, we used to have something called Pan-African e-network project. Now, for Libya, uh, we had uh, once again revived that project with the help of the Libyan Minister of Information and ICT, who was a dear friend and a visionary of sorts. So they wanted to take Libya to another level. Similarly, some of the Indian companies out of UK actually uh, were operating in the in education uh, field and also uh, trying to do, we used to have NIIT, which was working there um, and uh, trying to develop centers. But somehow the situation is like that, that most of the things have come to an end. There was a great scope for selling the, uh, the pickup trucks and the four wheelers uh, from India. We used to get uh, one of the persons uh, actually used to import and I helped him a great deal to get uh, the Hyundai cars, Verna Hyundai, from um, uh, Chennai plant directly uh, to Libya. So it was all going on there. We have, I want to tell you that we do have agree agreements with Libya. We had the first uh, treaty so I was signed in 1978, the Treaty of uh, Trade on Trade. We have avoidance of double taxation and prevention of fiscal evasion. Act. We have an agreement for cooperation in the field of health and medical sciences. We have an agreement on economic cooperation. We have a bilateral investment promotion and protection agreement uh, with Libya, apart from many others in the political and cultural field. So I would say we also have an Indo-Libyan Joint Commission. It had 10 meetings, but uh, I don't think any meetings have been held since uh, then. All the major Indian companies have had the projects there for several years, decades rather. Many PSUs like BHL, NBCC, OVL, IOC, OIL, Oil India, they were there. Private companies like Punjloy, Unitech, KC, SSB, Dastur, Engineering, Shapurji Palanji, Secon, Global Steel, one of the Spa Group companies, NIIT, Sun Pharma, Simplex Projects, and DS Construction. Now, there were all these companies. So we had the oil blocks, we had the interest, we were buying oil, we had uh, a, a and cement plants, Indian companies also have a very big cement plant which has been continuing there. So I see that we have a lot of possibilities, but the situation is very different. Now, how do you get over this? The Libyans have been coming and participating as you yourself mentioned in Vibrant Gujarat, they've been participating in some of the I4 Africa, there was an event in which they participated. There was a pharma expo in which several of them keep coming and doing it. As we talk today, there are three Libyan businessmen who are trying to go back to their country uh, because of the coronavirus uh, problem. And so we have this clear possibility, and I'm sure that when we have the India Africa Forum Summit uh, this year, uh, if it happens this year, uh, we will have a, a, a new look uh, for uh, how to help the new Libyans. Now, we are 
having a, a little, as I said, the trade is, uh, there are a lot of opportunities for Indians. I would just uh, mention a few for your information that we should think a bit of a long term as far as Libya is concerned. Of course, trade uh, and uh, when we are sending some uh, goods and uh, but trading is a different thing altogether. But we need to have a, a little longish uh, time frame. But how to go about doing it? For example, um, we, they, they want, Libya is keen to have foreign investments. But who's going to come under a situation when the country is virtually under siege due to the security situation? But as we are talking, there are countries which are taking benefit of this particular um, availability of the process. And the oil sector, you know, is something which should not have, which should have been affected. But you'll be surprised that everybody tries to get the oil flowing out of it for international reasons, for their own uh, reasons. So uh, Libya is essentially uh, have tried to, uh, what I have understood, is that now uh, they have set up that in every major sector now in order to get over in the short term uh, any bidding process have been generally avoided what they are doing is they are uh, they have set up five companies in each sector libyan companies who can uh, participate with any uh, foreign company who's registered with them for supplies of various things uh, and they could be the nodal providers of key items and key projects in the country now agriculture and food processing is one sector in which uh, we can help a great deal. Uh, consumer good, goods and the food products, rice, tea, coffee, sugar, uh, these are uh, very much wanted there and are being supplied. But at the same time, I received some queries from some people uh, with large quantities, but they said, sir, we want to only talk to the manufacturers. We want to tie up with them. So that is something that needs to be worked upon. Now, oil, soya oil, coffee, manpower exports, printing paper, transmission lines, silos, construction tiles, refineries, construction sector, rehab and healthcare. Agri-equipments, I see some companies are there in this area. They can provide drip irrigation, submersible pumps, power sector, electrification and transmission, including renewable energy. In fact, the ambassador here told me that only um, in November, uh, no, March, in March, some companies had come to buy uh, the oil equipment uh, and they found it as good as that of German. Uh, oil industry equipment from India. They are looking at pipes and they are looking at um, a power sector equipment uh, in a big way. Of course, we have a plan with the support of BHEL, but I think that the, the private KEC has been involved in the electrification and transmission. So there is a lot of possibility. Now we need to work more on the new sectors like renewable energy. So if you have renewable energy, you will have a much better uh, possibility of working that. ICT is one sector where they are very keen and they want to work. They're quite good uh, in that. But we need to understand that the, whether it's construction, sewage and water management, including export of tiles and stones, et cetera, they are very important now. Automobiles, tractors, implements, and oil and gas pipelines, valves, shipping and services, supply of graphite for the steel plants, machinery and spares and engineering goods. Right now, China, Turkey, European countries are the key competitors as far as we are concerned. So we need to work on it. But how do you work on it? I mean, when, as I have uh, tried to uh, tell you a landscape where we have east, west, and south, essentially. So I would, uh, my suggestion, and it has nothing to do, it is not drawing any lines, but just from the convenience point of view is that if you uh, wish to work, let's say, with the eastern part of Libya, that is uh, Benghazi and other areas there, then you need to have some kind of an agent, some kind of a partner there. In any case, it is important to have uh, an agent or a partner or, or importer of your products who require, who can follow your projects, who can uh, really be able to do things uh, for you because you cannot travel easily there. Similarly, if you are in the West, then you need to work in Tripoli and Misrata. These are the two places where you can find people or Seba in the South. So several companies are located in Egypt, which are looking after business into, um, into uh, Libya and supplying there. So you can have, or UAE for that matter, same way some shipping lines go to UAE and from there it is transported to the Turkey and Qatar are other players. So you can try from Turkey as well if you, if you have good contacts there. If you wish to set up something kind of thing, I would suggest that 
uh, the neighboring country is Tunis, which is good, Egypt from there. In the interim, of course, eventually you have to be there. Or Malta. Malta is a European country, European Union country, where if you have a branch office or something like that, that can help you. Algeria is another country which is also quite closely involved in the southern part of uh, uh, Libya. Now, some precautions that you need to take, and that is that uh, you should have a good and reliable local agent and partner in which the chambers, the businessman association uh, can help. Even we can provide you some leads if you wish to. The payment terms should be agreed well in advance and preferably try for 100% down payment and then negotiate as per your comfort level because that is quite difficult. Sometimes if there is a, 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 some kind of a trade dispute, it'll be very difficult to resolve it uh, at this stage given the kind of situation that happens there. Banking channels, LCs, uh, must be thoroughly checked and the, our embassy is located uh, uh, in Tunis as I said so they could be very helpful in providing you some information so and you must always uh, think in terms of force measure clauses not only in the oil sector but in every conceivable situation uh, because you are taking uh, uh, some kind of a risk but lastly I would like to tell you that if you want quick response it is important and imperative to try and communicate in Arabic language in the first instance. There are translation services, so whatever you are writing or sending it to them, it, it, it will uh, get a little more and a very quicker response than otherwise. So it is very uh, important if you want to do business with that part of the world, and that applies to uh, many countries, not only to Libya. But uh, at this stage, that does help. The, so far, I think there were some changes. Uh, the law was tweaked. The investment laws, if you are looking for uh, investment from their own point of view, uh, I can share with you, you can uh, send this, like the healthcare sector is very important today. And uh, the construction of hospitals, laboratories, diagnostic centers, manufacturing of medicines, medical requirements, they're looking at that and maintenance of the medical equipment. Then transportation, construction management of airports, handling land service in airports, building and application of civil aviation systems, air transportation, construction of roads, highways, subways, road, and road. So they want all that. Industry, they are looking, I mean, they have written down almost every single industry in which they want some waste recovery is very important. And so is the uh, chemical industries from their perspective. In the education sector, also they are open. They are open to construction of universities and educational institutions, training and vocational centers, schools and international institutes. In the health, uh, even you can use in the tourism sector, for example, hotels, tourist resorts, property and tourist villages. So that they, they keep asking you all kinds of things, what we can help them and in which we are really good. Now in the agriculture and maritime sector, again, cultivation of farm crops is very important. And if, of course, uh, Libya does not grow so many uh, crops as it is, but they are trying to do that. Perhaps we can use our, um, some of our techniques uh, in the drip irrigation or uh, which is like Icrisat in India has some of the drag, less water consuming uh, crop technologies that can be used. Public utilities, they're looking, water desalination plants, waste water purification drainage, waste recycling, all these are very important. And oil and gas, of course, as I said, is a very major sector which is governed by a different oil law. And uh, for, they are, they, as of on paper at least, they are providing a lot of incentives. They have, somebody asked me a question whether they have free trade zone. Yes, they have free trade zones and uh, they, uh, they they provide all kinds of benefits that are available anywhere. Um, and in fact, uh, at one time they had even for 97% of products, they had even uh, taken off all the customs duties. Now, the, the as you know, I mean, those who are in the business would know that uh, generally there are three or four types in the, as per 2018 law. There is, you can open a representative office. There are details available as to about 150,000 Libyan dinar you need and legally represent the company with marketing and oversight. But you may not make any money in Libya. So there are no tax dues in Libya. Then you can open a branch office, which is also very useful uh, because paper, uh, paperwork takes time everywhere because things are, do not work because it has to be under the Libyan tax law. So you require some of the uh, information. Then something they called a Mushtar, Mushtaraka company. This is for those who want to have a joint venture. Like the foreign company can own up to 65% of the company with minimum investment of 1 million Libyan dinar. Then, so these are the three or four types of company which you can uh, establish in Libya and do a business. Uh, 
I feel that now recently there is a new uh, management has come in the Tripoli Chamber, and likewise the Benghazi Chamber and the other places in the Sarasa Chamber of Commerce. But these people, Tripoli Chamber is the biggest chamber, which has about 55,000 companies. And they have, in fact, uh, very recently there was a problem for some 180 trucks coming, bringing food and every, all the stuff from Tunisia to Tripoli. Uh, and they were stopped because of the problems on the border, which happened, Ras al Jadid border. And therefore, this was the chamber that was able to help uh, get it released. And now it has got a good uh, and committed kind of people who want to do things. Uh, and uh, try to get back to normal. In fact, already their delegation had uh, gone to uh, Turkey and the Turkish people have been coming and they're trying to do the business there. So we need to be uh, innovative in one way that you have to see where uh, in the short term, medium term and long term, how are you going to look at it? And how is it going to, uh, what is your immediate interest uh, in Libya? Manpower, somebody asked me a question whether manpower is allowed. Yes, we used to have uh, manpower, we used to send a lot of nurses, we used to send other labor, but now the government has banned it at the moment. Uh, the ban is unlikely to be lifted soon. Uh, of course, it will depend on if our industry has a lot of interest and the thing, situation uh, settles down in uh, Libya. Uh, we will uh, live that, but that is only the time will tell. We do not know really how it is going to work out. Uh, but if you have a good project, uh, where your personal presence is not so much required uh, in the time being, or you can uh, work it from some neighbor country, or you find a very good partner. Uh, and for which, how do you find a partner? Is it the Indian embassy? You can ask, you can ask the chambers, or you can ask uh, the uh, Libyan embassy here. Even they're ready to help you, and they told me that they will be very happy uh, to render any assistance uh, if it is required by the Indian companies uh, who are looking uh, to go to the market. We hope that once things materialize, uh, there will be greater economic reforms. Uh, it will become far more simpler and easier. But please remember one thing, that a country, I mean, I have always maintained this, that there is definitely a physical and uh, other risks when you are going into a sort of a conflict zone, whether it is Iraq, whether it is Syria, or whether it is in Libya or Yemen or wherever. But if you are going there, you have to have a staying power. You must be prepared for initial setbacks, initial losses, but in the long term, you are going to be having that vertical advantage, which will take you uh, further, um, higher up. So I, have, I think I have answered quite a few questions that I received, but uh, um, let me just go through it. Somebody wanted to know, the, does India have any trade agreement? Yes, we do have, and I listed all of them. Libya being under sanctions, can goods be shipped from India? Yes, goods can be shipped, but Libya is under sanctions for the arms and ammunition and some other uh, goods which are specified by the UN and some other sanctions. So that, that are avoidable, but basically all other uh, goods are being uh, supplied by India already, uh, as is seen from the Commerce Ministry's website. Uh, you can refer to that. Then. Uh, Somebody wanted to know whether uh, about the scope for pharma and food products. And under the current times, uh, uh, when Libya is also suffering, not so dramatically, uh, is suffering from the COVID uh, thing, and they really don't have much of an equipment. Uh, so I believe that there is a great opportunity there. Food products, we are supplying, and I think you can find more resources uh, to supply to the country. Normally, you have to, for pharma products, you need to register. Uh, it takes about one to two months, and the licensing authority, Ministry of Health, uh, will do that. In fact, I remember that we had about 19 to 20 Indian companies uh, were already registered, the major ones, with the with the Libyan uh, authorities at that time. I don't know now. Once the license is issued to you, it applies for about six years, and it, you can have any any pharma produce, whether it is medicines, injectables. Uh, or, uh, but for herbals, I think there is only an import permission is required, uh, and Ayurveda goods, if anybody is into that field. So there only an importer is required who will apply for a license, import license, and it should not have any. Please remember in the healthcare sector that healthcare is the most important thing for any human being. So when we are doing something like that, I have faced these problems when I was in Nigeria. Please make sure that what you are supplying is of the highest and the best quality uh, thing. 
about the visa procedure well the visa procedure is like that the libyan uh, authorities here the master confirmed to me that right now they have suspended the visas for libya because of the covid 19 but once it opens or before that they were issuing the visas and uh, it's a simple procedure either the chamber can issue a letter or they can get an invitation from the uh, uh, libyan uh, authorities or your partner there or a company which is going to do that they give the visa but please do not forget that indian government has continued the ban on uh, travel to libya for your own safety and security so if you're going to tunis or something and you want to meet your partner you can invite them to tunis or to cairo or to some other countries and they'll be happy to come there they come here also so you can meet with them keep the register yourself with the jordanian uh, with the libyan embassy here and uh, they will be happy to connect you with them that is something which the uh, current child affairs uh, um, uh, confirmed to me today itself so <clears throat> free trade zone i have already told now you want the contact addresses of few importers the import data available now you see there are a lot of uh, data is available even on the open domain you can find it there are some directories also available but i have really no real faith in them for the simple reason that in the past 10 years of uh, problem there most of these would have uh, become outdated so i think that uh, what is the most important thing is to contact Indian Embassy, contact the Chamber of Commerce. Libyan Businessmen Association is a very strong body. and I'll be happy to help you if you need there. And uh, they will be uh, able to provide you the right kind of people. Or there is any of the embassies, especially the Libyan Embassy, should have uh, this kind of thing, uh, which would be useful. But of course, there is a EU database. There is a UK also database. There are some uh, other uh, uh, companies are available there are indians who are working there they can be of help to, to you then uh, education sector as i old uh, skill development and training this is a priority sector as i mentioned to you earlier that niit used to have an arrangement there uh, but anything that you do there if it is education related please be sure that it also you have some arabic uh, expertise and that is that comes very handy and it should be there you could talk to the uh, universities directly if you want to work uh, closely with them for starting new programs you can build your own technology iti's or kind of uh, technology institutions or centers of excellence uh, for them so you can always find a partner in the ministry of ict for example in that in the education ministry they will be happy to uh, to to provide you uh, some of uh, uh, this uh, uh, these details a skill development is very very important nowadays and uh, i think that uh, uh, they are they are also looking at india uh, in, in a very big way uh, in fact uh, what else is somebody asked me are there shipping services yes shipping services are going there but uh, recently from uh, suffix uh, is uh, port in tunisia uh, the first one uh, feeder services started uh, which went to Tripoli and it goes every 10 15 days and of course by road from there they are taking it uh, directly also to Misrata and some other places uh, the uh, the shipments are going so that is uh, not a problem yeah I think most of the questions here I have covered but what I want to once again tell you is that please look at uh, Libya as a medium to long-term opportunity and in the short term, whatever their immediate requirements are, try to provide those uh, to them. And uh, as much as uh, you can, of course, there are several resources that are available, but do try to use uh, the uh, information available in the embassies. Uh, see, keep them informed if you are doing some business there, especially nowadays, because that will help you um, in uh, not only identifying opportunities, but will also help you in case there is a problem so that they will be in the know of things rather than just going because sometimes what happens is online we meet somebody and then we land up in trouble and uh, today in the today's situation despite arbitration clauses and all i don't think much can come out of it libyans now like us they want us they want to grow with us uh, and we want to help them political level there is a great uh, affection uh, for helping libya and i think that uh, we will be very happy to work together on those. Uh, 
uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, I, I hope I have not uh, taken uh, much time that required. Thank you once again, uh, Sunanda. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Good evening, friends. I'm Sumit Govind Sharma, a proud committee member of the chamber and also the CEO of Group MRP India Private Limited. On behalf of the Chamber and on behalf of MII CIIA Chamber, we would like to extend our sincere gratitude and thanks to Ambassador Mr. Anil Kanganti for the excellent presentation and providing us with the detailed insights on Libya. We are confident that his expertise and experience will help all of us. We are also thankful to the Executive Director of Indo-Arab Chamber, Madam Sunanda, for always encouraging, motivating and giving valued guidance. But not last but not the least, all the diplomats, ex excellency, the uh, Indo-Arab uh, Chamber team, all our viewers, participants for showering their love and affection and showing tremendous confidence in us and giving us the gigantic support. This provides us with strength, the confidence and the motivation to get such eminent speakers to give us their valued inputs in making our webinars a great success. As promised by Madam Sunana Rajendran, we have planned the webinars for both uh, the Indo-African Chamber as well as the Indo-Arab Chamber, and that is twice in a month. Our next webinar is scheduled on the 16th of July, where we will cover the opportunities for business in Ethiopia and South Africa. Excellencies, the Consulate General of both the countries have already consented their esteemed presence. You will be receiving the formal invites from tomorrow. Please do attend and reap the benefits. It is a small attempt from our end to support the vision of the government of India in boosting, securing and promoting uh, bilateral trade between India and the Arab and African countries. Once again, we are thankful and grateful for all the support. Thanking you. Signing off, Sumit Govind Sharma.